I am now recording and I would like to introduce our most current presenter, Katrina Lopez. Her presentation will be on gut health and irritable bowel syndrome treatment. This presentation will go from 1025 to 1055. Um, my name is Lindsay Fensel, like I said previously, and I will just be help, help facilitating. So I did previously drop in a survey for you guys. I will drop it again, drop it into the chat once again, as some of you have joined since I did previously put it in there. I will also be putting it into the chat once again at the end of the presentation. Please make sure to mute your microphones throughout the presentation and do turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable doing so. We will leave time at the end for questions. So please keep your questions handy, but do not add them into the chat until the end of the presentation to not distract the presenter. Once again, I will just drop in a survey to the chat box right before um, the presentation starts. And then once again at the end. So you can take it away, Katrina. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Katrina Lopez and I chose gut health as my MNT topic or more specifically on irritable bowel syndrome and the low FODMAP diet. I wanna apologize for the window bar above. I did my presentation on Google Slides and I could not find a possible way to present without it. So with that being said, let's get started. So objectives, uh, we're going to go over the, my purpose, summary of the gut microbiome, irritable bowel syndrome, and then my three studies. So personal interests, like I assume a lot of us interns felt, it was pretty hard to pick a topic as most of the interesting topics dietitians are involved in can be a great uh, topic to talk about, but I chose to talk about my MNT when it comes to gut health because it's a new trending topic all over healthcare. And I think it's something that I want to be involved in understanding as I pursue my career and in helping breaking down the doubts about our gut's importance in our overall health. My sophomore year of undergrad, my microbiology professor was basically begging anyone in that class who enjoyed the topic to pursue a career involved in studying bacteria. As he said, it's an expansive and powerful world of research that is only growing and we need more experts to help strengthen the link of our gut and our health. And then later, as my brother was diagnosed with a form of colitis, I became more immersed in reading new research that involved how to manage our gut health. And with that research uh, in 2008, the National Institute of Health sponsored a huge research project called the Human Microbiome Project to sequence the bacteria and their genes in healthy individuals to better understand the link between our gut micro makeup and our overall health outcomes. I personally think this is an exciting realm of research as the gut microbiome has proven to contribute to far more than expected in understanding health genes and disease. So the lesser known part of our body's nervous system is located in our gut. It's called the enteric nervous system. This enteric nervous system has its own networks of nerves, neurons, and neurotransmitters that extend all the way down the entire digestive tract from the esophagus through the stomach, intestines, and down to the anus. Not only does the gut and brain communicate through the nervous system in the gut brain access, but also through hormones and the immune system. And like Dr. Claire Frazier says, uh, who was very heavily involved in the gut microbiome project, she said, unlike the human genome sequence, which is the genes that we're born with that we cannot change, our microbiota can be altered. Um, and for example, diabetes, that some people are born with certain genes and risk factors that give them more likelihood to develop the, the disease. Now there's growing knowledge of the ability to change the person's microbiome content to lessen their risk of developing diabetes. Um, our microbiome is very complex, but through this research, we've found that complexity has a purpose. And how complex is our gut? The human gut microflora has about 100 trillion microbiota um, and the colon's, home, the, the colon's home to over 400 different bacteria species. And all of these are crucial to many processes within our bodies. In fact, 70% of our immune system is located in the gut. 
So with all of the purposes that our gut, the gut bacteria do have within our health, um, there is a time when gut health becomes compromised. And that's when we start to see different disorders like Crohn's disease and colitis. And more specifically for me, talking about irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome is not to be confused with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, Inflammatory bowel disease is a group of conditions that causes the swelling and irritation in your digestive tract, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, irritable bowel syndrome is a common functional gastrointestinal disorder that affects the large intestines and is characterized by an alteration of the gut brain axis. So that's where they differ. And the pathophysiology of IBS is quite complex, varying from early life stress overgrowth of gut microbes, severe infection, abnormalities in enteric system, and disordered muscle contractions. IBS affects about 11% of the population, with women being twice as likely to have IBS. There's no test to definitely diagnose IBS, but with medical history, a physical exam, and a multitude of tests to rule out all other digestive issues like those Crohn's and colitis, then there is a diagnostic criteria called the Rome criteria that they can use to diagnose IBS, which I will get into later. So common signs and symptoms of IBS you might be aware of, um, abdominal dissension, flatulence, cramping, diarrhea, constipation, and then we get into more severe cases of IBS, or we find unintentional, unintentional weight changes that have to do with malabsorption due to the inflammation coming from IBS. Um, so malabsorption of nutrients that cause those weight changes, and they can also cause sleep disturbances, constant fatigue. Um, and then you also do see signs as food intolerances and allergies. So adequate therapy is to treat this syndrome are not yet available and therapeutic strategy focuses mainly on treating the different sy symptoms individually without a global approach. So first line um, of treatment is usually education on those causes of IBS. So those trigger foods and whatnot. Um, then there's stress management and relaxation techniques as stress really does irritate and cause that inflammatory response within the body. So we do get those symptoms heightened with those stress and all that. Um, but most people with IBS, unfortunately, learn to deal with it as they either don't understand that it is a condition and they don't seek help, or doctors are also not seeing it as a condition. So they, and with it being very hard to diagnose, they aren't being diagnosed correctly. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of people learn to, to deal with it. But studies show that diet changes can account for about 57% of gut microbiota changes, while genes only account for 12%. So that's where we get into this global approach that is very specific to IBS. Um, and it means basically, it's not tackling those different symptom symptoms individually, like common IBS medications or other treatment therapies are doing, they're really only or attacking one symptom. And the global approach is looking at finding a way to, to tackle a the whole greater symptoms involved. So the constipation, the diarrhea, the distension, all those things, finding a way to treat it globally. And so in my case, I'm looking into the low FODMAP diet as a global approach. And so what is FODMAPs? FODMAP is a acronym that is called fermentable oligo monosaccharides and polyols. These are a large class of small non-digestible carbohydrates, um, which can be found in a range of very common and different foods, such as fruits, vegetables, legumes, cereals, honey, milk products, dairy products, and sweeteners. So as you can see, um, sometimes it seems a little bit random in terms of foods, but it has to do with these, so these specific foods having those non-digestible carbohydrates that cause that inflammation that you see in IBS. So moving on to my first study, the low FODMAP diet for irritable bowel syndrome, some answers to the doubts from a long-term follow-up. This was a very recent study done in 2020 
and their purpose, uh, the short and long-term efficacy and nutritional adequacy of a low FODMAP diet in the patient's long-term acceptability. I want to really emphasize the long-term aspect of this study as there are very, very few studies out there that look into the long-term aspect of following a low-term a low FODMAP diet. Um, most studies are very short term that comes with um, a lot of doubt in the low FODMAP treatment. And so there's not a lot of uh, money going into these studies, so they can't do a long term study. But this is one of the very few studies I found that looked into a, not just a couple weeks and more. This study is over a two year period. So it is pretty strong, in my opinion. So typical treatment, um, if is it is being treated um, is avoiding trigger symptoms, eating those um, high fiber foods, um, and then you know avoiding gluten and high gas foods. So basically FODMAP foods, but diet as a therapy um, has not been a central platform for management, mainly again, because evidence base for reduction or re exclusion of specific foods has been poor. Um, there's kind of a negative stigma behind exclusion of foods, as you can think, you. A lot of people, it's natural to think that if you're excluding foods, you're excluding very um, crucial nutrients. But um, the key to success for that is a registered dietitian, as we know how to make sure that our patients are getting what they need in terms of nutrition adequacy, um, in terms of a low FODMAP diet. So exclusion data for these patients, as you can imagine, would be um, patients taking laxatives or drugs acting on abdominal pain um, four weeks before diagnosis were excluded, um, or other organic diseases, lactose intolerance, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and then other digestive issues. Those people were excluded as we wanted to really look into specific IBS patients. And then inclusion data was that room for diagnostic criteria that involves looking into defecation, change in stool frequency, and change in stool appearance. And so they take those data and then they can create the criteria to diagnose someone with IBS. So this study had a total of 73 IBS patients in the beginning. Um, they were all IBS patients. They weren't healthy individuals, specifically IBS. Um, but then by the final um, number of IBS patients was 41 that were fully eva evaluated longitudinally, longitudinally, whoa, longitudinally um, over those two years. Um, and that has to do with basically any study, a two-year study is very long, and so you have a lot more risk of dropouts. Um, and then al along with that, some people dropped out due to difficulty with the diet. And then we also had patients that had to drop out because they wanted to stick to the low FODMAP diet and not move on to the next stage. Um, so, cause they were seeing such great benefits from the low FODMAP diet, they didn't want to move on. So they had to drop out, unfortunately. And then with it being a long-term study again, um, incomplete questionnaires caused them to have to drop out in those follow-ups. So going into the methods of this study, T0, um, emphasis again with the dietitian being heavily involved in this study, um, dietitian would go to specifically to each individual patient um, and look at their typical diet, habitual diet, and they would find the high FODMAP foods um, restrict them and replace them with low FODMAP foods and make it very individual to eat patient, each patient. And then for eight weeks, they were to follow that specific diet. Um, and then every two weeks, the dietitian would contact the patients by telephone to uh, resolve any problems related to their dietary management. And then they also had the email of the dietitian to be asked any questions if they were having any concerns or problems within those eight weeks. And then coming back to T1, um, after those eight weeks, is the reintroduction phase. And so again, the dietitian was heavily involved in reintroducing um, one FODMAP food at a time and then having them eat that for four days and then assessing symptoms that have to do with IBS and then doing that for all the FODMAP foods until um, T2, where then we had the ad LFD diet. So after identifying those trigger foods of the FODMAPs, 
and also the FODMAPs that they were able to consume without symptoms, the dietitian then reassessed the diet, took out the high um, symptom FODMAPs, and then made the added LFT diet that was customized again to each patient's preferences with those FODMAP foods that they were able to eat and taking away those other FODMAP foods that cause those symptoms. And then T3 was they were supposed to follow that for six months and come back to be assessed via gastrointestinal and nutritional medical checkups. And then every six months after that, up to two years, they were again assessed. And I want to mention there was no difference in energy and macronutrient content found between the habitual diet, LFT diet, and add LFT diet. But that, again, is thanks to a dietitian being so heavily involved in making sure they were nutritionally adequate with their diets. So outcomes that were being assessed um, before T0, T1, T2, and T3, and then every six months for, for two years included questionnaires, uh, IBS symptom severity score, uh, quality of life assessment, um, quality of sleep, degree of patient satisfaction, degree of relief, adherence to those diets, and the perception of trigger foods. This study had a ton of data um, and the graphs were really confusing, so I left them out. But um, if anyone wants to look into that, there's a ton of data that comes with it. So summary, the LFT, was effective in reducing IBS symptoms in the group of patients, not only after the strict LFT diet, but also in the ad LFT diet in T3. Um, even the anxiety and depressive symptoms diminished and the quality of life went up, not only again in the strict phase, but also in the ad LFT diet. And um, the researchers made it very apparent that the prompt and careful Suggestions of a skilled RD prevented the onset of possible drawback in the IBS patients. If they had any concerns, they were able to reach out to the RD and make sure they were fixed. And then the percentage of patients who judged the LFT and add LFT to be effective in the follow-up was about 50%, which is great and consistent with all the other loads of LFT treatment studies, including those medications that are common to treat with IBS, severe IBS. Um, so. My opinion of the study, I think it's great. Uh, the study, similarly to most studies investigating the LFT and IBS, is not randomized placebo control study, which when it comes to grading and the ELL, EAL um, grading, it is considered very low and it is a negative study due to it not having a control group or it being randomized. Um, but so it clearly lowers the level of, of evidence, but as stressed by the authors, the difficulty of finding a real sham diet or a control diet is very common and difficult condition to overcome when it comes to this, um, specifically with LFD, as uh, they tend to be more biased when you get to that control diet, the high FODMAP foods, they tend to be way higher than the, than the usual intake of FODMAP foods. So the the authors chose to not have a control group as they just wanted to minimize the bias that comes with a control group um, and make sure that they're really looking into the potential that the low FODMAP uh, diet could have. And then again, the pivotal role of a skilled RD um, able to explain the nature and the aim of the diet, ensuring nutritional adequacy and favoring patients' compliance has to be stressed. So even though this is considered maybe a low grade study, um, with my analysis, I think it showed very positive outcomes. In fact, that it was a very long-term study showed that it really could be beneficial to have an RD involved in making sure patients can um, follow the diet and be successful in diminishing their IBS symptoms. So moving on to my next study, a diet low in FODMAPs reduces symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. So their research purpose investigated the effects of a diet low in FODMAPs compared with an Australian diet and randomized control single blind crossover trial of patients with IBS. So their inclusion exclusion data is pretty similar to the last study. Um, a lot of uh, abdominal surgeries, uh, patients that had already seen an RD to try and treat their symptoms or again, taking those laxative drugs to help 
um, with the pain and swelling, and then lactose intolerance, those were all excluded. And then inclusion data was patients with IBS, according to Rome 3 criteria, and healthy controls um, without gastrointestinal symptoms were recruited. And I want to mention um, Rome 3 seems different than Rome 4, but it is actually the same uh, criteria. Uh, just Rome 4 is the most current criteria. Um, so they updated the Rome 3 to Rome 4. So they're very similar. It's just honestly a changing of wording and just adding a couple things. So the number for this study was a lot smaller. Um, there's 30 IBS patients and then eight healthy individuals. So this study differed in the fact that they did assess against a healthy individual group without IBS. And so their methods, um, they were matched for demographics and diet. Um, they collected dietary data uh, for diet, for intake um, from subjects for just one habitual week. So they were allowed to eat their normal typical diet for one week and record all of their symptoms. And then once they did that, they came back and they were randomly assigned to groups that were received 21 days of either a diet low in FODMAPs or the typical Australian diet. So the typical Australian diet as a control would be high in FODMAP foods. Um, almost all the foods were provided by the study. And so after those 21 days on either the low or the typical Australian diet, that was then followed by a washout period of at least 21 days to get back to the same level as during the baseline period in terms of symptoms. And then after those 21 days, um, they would then move cross over to the other diet and do that for 21 days. And daily symptoms were rated using zero to 100 visual analog scale. And all stools were collected from days 17 and 21 and assessed for frequency, weight, water content in the King stool chart rating. So summary of this study, subjects with IBS had lower overall gastrointestinal symptom scores while on a diet low in FODMAPs compared with the Australian diet and the habitual diet. Bloating, pain, and passage of wind also were reduced while IBS patients were on low FODMAP diet. Symptoms were minimal and unaltered by either diet among controls as you can expect. And then patients of all IBS subtypes had greater satisfaction with stool consistency while on the low FODMAP diet, but diarrhea predominant IBS was the only subtype with altered fecal frequency and king stools chart scores. So strengths and limitations of the study. It was randomized, blinded crossover, so a lot stronger in terms of study type. Um, the control was less biased with the usual Australian diet. That typical Australian diet that was used was designed to represent the very usual dietary intake of FODMAPs, um, which was comparable with previously published data on the intake of healthy Australians. So they looked into that and made sure it was very adequate. But um, going on to those limitations, um, the authors did say that the oligosaccharide and polyol content was overestimated. So like the authors from the last study, this is something that they wanted to avoid in terms of bias. And then we see it here in this study, they did overcompensate on the high FODMAP in the control group. Um, and then there were obviously dropouts and it was not truly long-term. It was longer, but it was not your ideal long-term study. So my opinion of this study, it did get a positive EAL, EAL rating. Um, I support it as a first line therapy as for both studies, again, it shows very positive outcomes. The RD shows to be very crucial. They didn't have that big of a role in this study as it did in the first study. Um, and it was kind of shown in the study throughout that their role not being as significant did hinder the compliance a bit. And then the length also hinders the effectiveness and the controlled diet proved to have some bias, but it, overall it was a very positive study. So moving on to my third and last is FODMAPs alter symptoms in the metabolome of patients with IBS, a randomized control trial. 
So this purpose of this study was to compare effects of the low FODMAP and high FODMAP diets on symptoms, the metabolome, and the microbiome of patients with IBS. So again, it's very, very, very similar in their inclusion data, exclusion data. Um, and then inclusion data as well is very similar. They were also doing Rome 3. I think Rome 4 was adapted in 2019 or 2020. So this study was 2017. So they also were using Rome 3, but again, very similar criteria. And this study differed in the fact that it was all IBS patients and no healthy individuals were assessed. So the methods for this study, um, patients on visit one received just verbal and written information. It was, um, random, it was randomized and um, blinded, so they weren't told what exactly they would be doing. Um, and then exclusion criteria was assessed by a questionnaire. In visit two, day zero of the study, patients completed the IBS symptom severity questionnaire, underwent a baseline lactulose breath test, um, and provided a urine and stool sample to get um, the makeup of their gut so they could compare. So all the bacteria in there, that's what those tests were looking at. And then they were randomized to either the high FODMAP content diet or the low FODMAP content diet. And they were also provided a dietary log booklet where they would record their daily food intake for the three week study period that they were involved in. So visit three, after those 21 days, the patients underwent the same testing. And then following completion of the study, the dietitian involved scored the FODMAP content in the diet logs in a blinded fashion using a scoring system specifically designed for the study. So those strengths and limitations, again, so it is randomized and blinded, which is great, um, but then the limitations are the short term of three weeks and the dropouts and the bias that comes with a high FODMAP diet as a control. The summary of this study, uh, histamine, a, a measure of immune activation was reduced eightfold in the low FODMAP group. Low FODMAP diet increased the actinobacteria richness and diversity. So basically the overall bacteria within the gut increased immensely and the high FODMAP diet decreased the relative abundance of bacteria involved in gas consumption. So that high FODMAP diet um, decreased the ability to um, get away from those symptoms, the gas and the bloating and all that. And then they correlated the FODMAP diet Dairy, diary scores and global IBS symptom scores and found a positive correlation between IBS symptoms, severity, and their level of FODMAP consumption. So overall, really positive outcomes. And again, with this study, kind of the same opinion um, in terms of RD being more crucial, and they didn't hold a lot of emphasis. The RD didn't do as much as in the first study and uh, making sure everyone was compliant. They just looked at it in the end of the study as how compliant they were through those dairy, diary logs. So that could have had definitely been impacted if they were more involved. Um, and then the length hinders, again, the true effectiveness. Since um, the low FODMAP diet is dietitian taught, dietary restriction would have more varying degree of compliance and depend on the patient's degree of understanding, food choices, and motivation for altering dietary habits, as well as the dietitian's advice on level of food FODMAP restriction required. So again, through these studies, very it's very uh, apparent that it is possible to see a really great reduction in those IBS symptoms, but it is crucial to have an RD involved in making sure patients are aware of what it means to be following a low FODMAP diet, as it is a hard diet to follow, but it is so crucial, it is so beneficial to be following that diet and reducing those symptoms. And this study got a neutral score due to such a short term, only being three weeks. Um, and then a bit of bias that came with it, but overall a great study. And that's it, if you have any questions. Thank you. All right, if anybody has any questions,
please add them to the chat. And I will be once again dropping the link for this survey in case anyone didn't see it the first time. All right, if no one has any questions, I'm just going to kind of close this up. So the next set of presentations will go from 11 to 11.30. So you have a little bit of a break. There will be Cecilia Rodriguez um, on orthorexia nerviosa, and then Chelsea will be on a cardiovascular disease and Mediterranean diet. So if you have any questions, please, like I said, drop them in the chat below and we'll stay on for a little bit longer. But if you want to get into the next presentations, please do that too. On a personal note, I was curious if your brother attempted doing something similar. Yeah, he he definitely did. Um, he ended up having to go see a naturopathic doctor who put him on a pretty similar low FODMAP diet. It wasn't specifically low FODMAP, but it when I looked into it, it was very pretty much just avoiding those FODMAP foods. And he definitely saw um, a benefit. And it was mostly before he was diagnosed with colitis, he also had a problem with eczema. And with that, he saw symptom reduction in his eczema from that too, um, which was really cool to see because he had pretty severe eczema as well, which is a symptom of IBS as well. Great question. Thank you.